in the last few months, I've been reading a fellow named James Luther Adams. I've actually returned to him. I used his readings in uh, uh, in in the book uh, "Prophet to the Powerful," which was published by uh, Harvard and put immediately into the um, public domain around 2000, about seven years after Adams died. And I returned to that. He makes good daily readings, his little five-page sermons in there. He lived from 1901 to 1993 and was active from the late 20s until his death. He was the most important liberal theologian of the 20th century. And, of course, he was a Unitarian. Adams taught at Meadville Lombard for many years and later at Harvard. And he's, it's important for you use to know and study Adams because Adams made his life's work the articulation of a liberal theology that has depth and weight. In Adams' hand, it turns out that a liberal theology is anything but thin. James Luther Adams was one of eight children, and he grew up on the plains of eastern Washington state. His dad was a millennialist, fundamentalist preacher, a fun fundamentalist of the third kind, we might say. He was known, his dad was known to pray for the second coming to happen in the middle of dust storms. Many nights, his, the children were told as they went to bed that they might not wake up in the next morning, they might be snatched up into the air with Jesus before that time came. What a way to grow up. So quite naturally, when Adams went off to college in Chicago, he began to search. He started out by getting into a lot of good trouble. Uh, he founded an atheist newspaper at uh, Northwestern. He started working he, he started searching and working on his own inside job, asking, not what he did he reject, but what did he know in his bones about religion? What did he know? He started a men's study group of like-minded liberal uh, religious people who had open minds, and together they read philosophy, they read the Greek and Latin classics and the Bible critically. They read psychology and high literature and discussed and dissected what they read until they found consensus or at least until they could understand and argue the other side's point as rigorously as they could their own. They started out not from what they believe, but from what they knew as a matter of empirical fact, which is something that most of you use today can, can identify with, or many of us at least. That's why Adams went back to Germany in 1936. He had been there in 27, and he went back in 36 and 37 and that's where Carl Jaspers told him that liberal religion has no zwang, no costing commitment. Adams later wrote that Jaspers' rebuke of liberal religion ultimately came down to what many people would call the thinness of liberal theology. In answering that challenge, Adams became known in his teaching and preaching life for articulating a liberal theology that has depth and weight many of the words in our seven, eight principles now, uh, we hope soon officially, and six sources. Uh, many of those, those uh, principles and sources are Adam's words. For a 30,000 foot view of what Adam's work can mean to us here in 2024, let's look at how Adam's redefined three terms that troubled him as a refugee from conservative religion. These three terms likewise troubled me when I came into the UU fold, and I suppose some of you as well. And then we'll see how Adams used those terms to state in clear terms, at least for Adams, the purpose of the liberal church. He had, he had already been trying to figure out what religious terms meant to him because he had rejected his religious background and his, his upbringing. That's de deconstruction, right? Taking it apart. He didn't believe any of it. And in college, he had already deconstructed everything he had been taught about religion. And now it was time for him to reconstruct a liberal religion from the ashes of what he had been taught to believe, which had failed him. 
So first things first, his three terms, why religion? That's the first of those. Why religion anyway? Why bother with religion? Why should it be an issue? To Adams, the purpose of religion is whatever gives fundamental meaning and fulfillment to a person's life. Religion is the search for the highest and most important thing in a person's life. And when we find it, we're, what we're religious about is what we're willing to die for. But religion itself is not the thing. The thing that's most important, religion is the search for that thing. And when you find that thing, you found the object of your religious practice and your religious fervor and your religious dedication and commitment to the very end. Now, Adams found that thing, the object of his religious search, of his search for meaning. He found that thing on that second trip to Germany in 1936 when he was working in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's underground confessing church. At one point, Adams was physically inter interrogated by the Gestapo for several hours. And on that trip, and not just in the interrogation room, which became somewhat physical, but out of all those experiences, Adams came face to face with what he was not. And he learned through that confrontation what he was. This is a recurring theme in Adams' work. And we can learn what we are by studying what we are not and then figuring out how we're different from it. Adam's highest ideal, the root of his religion, what he lived for, what he was willing to die for, that ideal for Adams became democracy out of that cauldron of experience in Germany. For different people, that ideal is going to be different things. For Adam's Nazis, that ideal was Hitler and Arianism for his opponents. By studying them, he learned what he was not. But for Adam's God became synonymous with good. Whatever a person cherishes above all else and gives its, that person's self to in devotion that is sparked by love. Far from the angry sky God of his millennialist baggage, for Adams, the object of his religion became democracy. And we find that in our fifth source today. Finally, the word faith I said that wrong. We found that in our fifth principle today. Finally, the word faith until I found Adam's definition of faith. I often would feel the hair standing up on the back of my neck when I heard a UU say, keep the faith or referring to our faith in the pulpit, our faith, whose faith, maybe yours, not mine. Uh, and Adam's really helped me out with this because and, and now for me, it's beautiful. Adam's retranslation of the word faith harks back to Hebrews 11.1, 1, which I'm sure he was aware of, and it rings from my childhood as well. It was something like faith is the confidence of things hoped for and the evidence of things not unseen. I always hated that one. How can I have confidence in something I just hoped for in something I can't see uh, or have no evidence for? It sounded just like one of those biblical rhetorical devices. It was circular reasoning. And then along came Adam's faith, redefined that for me and for you, if you want it to. He said, faith is the certainty, starting the same way as Hebrews 11, 1, 11, uh, 11, 1. But he said, faith is the certainty that we have everything we need to solve all our problems together. Faith is the certainty that we have everything we need to solve our problems together. I like that. I feel I can be certain of that. I have to be certain of that in order to have meaning today. If, you know, if, if I didn't believe, choose to believe, and I can choose to believe that at least for today. And if I didn't believe that, we had everything we need to solve all our problems together, then frankly, you'd find me very depressing this morning. And I'd probably think you were all a bit silly too. So we wouldn't even be here together this morning. And I wouldn't like that at all. So I have that kind of faith. These three elements, 
Religion is a search for a person's meaning. God is for what we find, the good things that we find in that search, whatever they are. And faith is the certainty that we have everything we need to complete that search. These three elements come together in what Adams defined as the mission of the liberal church. And so Adams asked himself, in effect, what have I done lately that would convict me in a fascist court? That question caused him to focus on the voluntary associations that make democracy strong. For Adams, working in the voluntary associations that, that lie at the root of democracy made for meaning for the church. These voluntary associations are the associations or, or collaborations we form as human beings under our First Amendment right to free speech and peaceable assembly. Voluntary associations are about creating social wealth instead of material wealth. Adams wrote that for democracies to survive and flourish, the voluntary association is required as a medium for the assumption of civic responsibility. Voluntary associations are essential for democracies to exist, and they're essential for human beings to be fully human. Voluntary associations are the groups we form ourselves into to accomplish the work that we find ourselves on this planet to do, to cause justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like a running stream. Adams made clear the importance of voluntary associations as groups by naming them in his reformulation of Matthew 720 from the traditional by their fruits you shall know them. Some of you may remember that if you had a Protestant upbringing. He changed by their fruits, you shall know them, to his version, by their groups, you shall know them. The groups are the fund, are the voluntary associations, and those are the groups by which you shall know democratic institutions. But when Adams talked about voluntary associations, he's not just talking about being a joiner and putting something on your resume. He's talking about the indispensable role of autonomous groups standing midway between the individual and the state. The autonomous groups that are halfway there where we come together to support and influence and maintain the state. So voluntary associations then become essential for a democracy to exist. They include nonprofits and volunteerism, but there's so much more. Examples include advocacy groups like Planned Parenthood or the Sierra Club, community groups like Nature Neighborhood Watch, public charities like Justice Jobs, social welfare organizations like Human Rights Watch and civic groups like the Rotary and the Civitans, self-help groups like AA and Al-Anon and Crystal Meth Anonymous, even government agencies like the EPA during administrations when they're run responsibly. In addition, Adams regarded political parties, political consultations and advocacy and grassroots community organizing to be voluntary associations. And they also include churches and synagogues and mosques like the Unitarian Universalists of Gettysburg. For Adams, voluntary associations are vital for the church to have meaning. He wrote that if voluntary associations are essential for democracies to exist, then the church is a special type of voluntary association, a special type. What type of special type? The church goes out into the world through voluntary associations. Church members, he says, have a responsibility, a duty to participate in associations that include both church members and non-church members. He says we have a duty as church members to, particip to participate in associations that define and redefine the actual situation. In other words, that call out would-be authoritarian leaders as the power mongers that they are. He says, we as church members have a duty to participate in associations that speak truth to power, and we're duty bound to participate in associations that create social change, provide social stability through dialogue and consensus making. That's important, the how, dialogue and consensus making. Think back to the 
to the uh, children's story. We as church members are also, he says, duty bound to select and participate in the voluntary associations that contribute to the shaping of history and to the shaping of ourselves, regardless the ultimate cost. So much for a thin liberal theology. I wish I'd had this kind of ammunition in my conversations with my dad about liberal theology. In Adam's construct, the church exists as a special kind of voluntary association for the purpose of priming us, you and me, for spiritual outpouring, the Greek word kenosis from the Christian Bible. Voluntary association, the church primes us for spiritual outpouring through social action for social justice, shaping history through our chosen specific voluntary associations out in the secular world. If you'll remember just one thing from this sermon, I hope it's this. Liberal theology doesn't have to be thin. It's not a self-driven liberal do-goodism. And it's not the dregs left over after we've deconstructed supernatural mythologies from the ages. Liberal theology can have depth and weight. And we need to own that whenever somebody asks us what, we need to own that. A liberal theology with depth and weight. Whenever someone asks us what Unitarian Universalists believe. Our theology is built from what we know. Those are the building blocks, not from what we've been told. And our purpose as a church, then, is to commit ourselves to voluntary associations to build the democratic ideal, which is our fifth principle, for a good reason. And when we, as church members, assemble in faith, we exist as a special kind of voluntary association that is here for the purpose of priming us, you and me, to pour ourselves out in this coming week. May it be so.